what's your word for the season? And I'm there like, oh, what is my word for the season? What? But it's a great question because it's looking forward intentionally at what is our word for right now? What are we looking forward to? What are we declaring over ourselves? Because life gets in the way and will demand of us. But if we are intentionally saying, no, Jesus, we look forward in this season to this thing, then it will make a difference. James, he warns us, he goes on to say, verse 19, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, someone should bring that person back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. He's saying someone should bring them back, that we all have a responsibility to bring back the wandering soul into community. Talks about how it's through the error of their way, through wandering, which tells us that the once saved, always saved is just not true. That's why we offer every one of our services an opportunity, not just for the new believer to come into faith in Jesus, but also for those of us who have wandered And we need to say, God, I am coming back afresh. God, I am coming back. I'm committing my everything to you. James says, look forward to a hope that's coming and encourage others to do the same. And lastly, he says this, point number three, look upward. Look upward. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will rise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Are you troubled? He says, pray. Are you cheerful? Sing. Are you sick? He says, call the elders of the church. And then he goes on to talk about the power of prayer. Prayer is mentioned seven times. He goes on to talk about. And this was in a time where many apostles, and and still today, maybe many people believe it's only the apostles that could heal. But he's saying, no, the elders of the church, there are people today who can still pray in faith and see healing. And so what is the prayer of faith? What does that mean? Does that mean, oh, if it doesn't happen, it's because I lack faith? Well, there's a story, Mark 9, where a dad brings his son to Jesus to be healed. And he says, teacher, I brought you my son. If you can do anything, help us. And Jesus replies, if you can. Jesus says, anything is possible for the one who believes. And the father says, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And guess what? Still, Jesus heals the son. And so I don't think it's fully we can say on our our belief in in faith and that, because it's about just a mustard seed. There's times in our lives, mustard seed amount of faith. God talks about can move mountains. Question number two that it kind of throws up is, does this prayer of faith promise healing? It says there, you will be healed. Yes, I think it does. But it doesn't necessarily mean this side of eternity. doesn't necessarily mean in the way that we want it to be in our minds. You know, Jesus, even on the cross, he says, Father, take this cup from me. If there's any other way, please. He didn't, he begged. That was an unanswered prayer. He still went to the cross. Even Jesus had unanswered prayer in that moment. And then question number three. What is the connection there with confessing our sins and with healing? We all fall short of the glory of God, but there's a bit there, it's strange. Verse 15, it says, The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. They will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other so that you may be healed. You'd think it would be the other way around, that the sick would be healed and that the, those confessing sins would be forgiven. But he says it the other way round. And what James assumes in this text is that the sick person is part of community. Because there is power in our community. There is power against sin in community. Accountability with one another, it gives power. When something comes into the light, when a situation, it kind of loses its power 
over us. And there are some sins which we just can't overcome alone. We have to speak it out. We have to get some accountability, some prayer. When we're living in that place of unconfessed sin, it robs us of our peace. How, the, how we approach the world is different, how we look at ourselves, how we look at Jesus, how we live in a place of freedom. It, it robs us of that because it takes something off our peace. And I want to say today that there is no one that is too far into a, a situation of maybe unconfessed sin from Jesus to be able to reach out today and just say, hey, you're, you're mine. You're mine, you're my child. That I was there as we look backwards on the goodness of what I have done through your life, but also as we look forward, I'm still there. I'm not a father who comes and beats and, and is cruel, but I'm a loving father who is there to catch us when we fall. And so today I encourage you, we're going to have some prayer ministry time, but if you have an area of unconfessed sin, I'd encourage you, just come and share it. Be set free from it today. Because yes, Jesus is there, but you know, also he calls us to a better way. He calls us to a better life. He calls us to a, a freedom and a peace that is found only in him. And so I'd encourage you, if you're in the room, to get prayer. Also, if you're online, message. We would love to stand with you in prayer for that. And then as I wrap up, I... Part of my testimony is I had a time when my mum was very sick. If you've been around, you would have heard me talk about it before. She was on a life support machine, and we were told 50% chance that she wouldn't wake up and 50% chance that she would wake up but completely brain dead. And I, people came and prayed. I text Rachel Smith over there, and she called for Steve and different people to come and lay hands on my mum. And I didn't have any faith in that moment, really. I remember I didn't pray. I didn't even say amen, I don't think, because I took it as concrete, what those around me were saying. And I remember so clearly Steve just quoting Romans 8 to me. I hadn't heard it before. When he says, you don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through our wordless groans. And some of you today... I know will have been groaning, not knowing what to pray. Maybe it's a child who grew up in church loving Jesus. They've gone so far away that you don't even know the words to continue to pray day in, day out for that child. There's groans within you. Maybe it's physical stuff. Actually, even just being here today was a battle because of pain, because of your body, because of different situations that... You've had to overcome to be here today. A place of long suffering. Well, today we're going to anoint with oil at the end of the service. We're going to have some ministry time. And there's two reasons for anointing with oil. Healing, but also for a specific purpose or a specific role or a specific new season you're stepping into. And I felt today that there's some people, maybe you're heading off to university, you're starting a new job, today is going to be significant in that you're going to just say, God, here I am again. I am looking upward in this season to you, King Jesus. There's nothing special about the oil. It's symbolic. I remember I was sharing before with some of the prayer team that we once had a prayer meeting at our old building in uh, Trumpington down the road. And <laughs> I remember we used garlic-infused olive oil. It was rough, horrible. <laughs> you would not have wanted to be anointed with that oil. There's no garlic in today's oil. But it is a symbol of God saying, Exodus 29, he talks about, you shall take the anointing or pour it on his head and anoint him. Anointing symbolizes setting apart for a particular purpose. Levit Leviticus talks about, and he poured some anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him, to call him sacred. We're going to do that today. If you enjoyed this video today, why not give it a like? Furthermore, why not subscribe to our channel as we seek to share the light and love of Jesus into your life?